Okay, so we're going to talk a, bit, a little bit about Builder Chat. So when we launched the remote weekly business forum, uh, it was when word came down that everything was going into quarantine and everybody kind of got thrown into a panic. We knew everyone needed lots of information and we kind of threw together a forum really quickly to try to meet the needs that everyone had. And in those early days, what we really needed was to hear from experts. We really needed to hear how does this PPP work and what is it and how do I apply and what does a, forgiveness look like? There was a fire hose of information. So I really needed to parse that information quickly to get it out to the people who needed yeah. it. What does the law say? What does tax code say? But as time goes by, we feel like what you guys need the most and we're happy to hear your feedback if we're right or wrong but we feel like what you guys need is a place to talk to each other and a place to kind of throw ideas around about what you're seeing what's happening we still want to hear from experts and we still want to have experts in the room so that they can chip in and answer those important questions when they know the answer but we want to hear more participation from you guys we want to hear more of you guys telling each other what you're seeing and what you're doing we have questions about uh, morale so as business consultants, we have some answers, mm -hmm. things that help with morale. But more importantly, you guys are doing stuff every day. And some of the things that you're doing are working great. And some of the things that you're doing are not working great. And that's what we want is for you to be able to share that with each other. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the idea of Builder Chat. The other piece is we started to feel like the topic of the week format was becoming a little bit restrictive because so much is changing and so much is happening that you guys wanna ask about a lot of different stuff every week. And so when we limit it and say, okay, we're only talking about safety right now, then that kind of takes all those other questions and you gotta wait for the right topic to come up before it's appropriate. It could be four weeks before we get an answer. So even though we will have different experts with us throughout time and we'll let you know who we're expecting to see mm -hmm. and who those experts are, uh, and, and it's great to kind of focus on questions we have the right experts to chime in on. We want you guys to be able to ask any question you want and talk about anything you want because as the world changes, what you need changes from week to week. So that's kind of what today is gonna to look like and we're gonna be kind of trying to kick some of these questions back to you guys and say, here's the question, what do you guys think? And so the more that you guys can chime in and participate, the better this is gonna be for everyone. So we're gonna put a question out, and if somebody has something they want to weigh in about, use the yes button. Check that yes box saying, yes, I have input, I wanna, I wanna share something, and then that will be the key, and then we'll call on you and get everybody into that conversation. Yeah, but yep. also don't hesitate to just chime in. If yep. it's quiet, just unmute yourself and start talking. Go for it. If we talk over each other, that's okay. Yep. Part of human contact. So yeah. we, we do wanna to touch a little bit on current events. Uh, we're gonna yep. keep it short and sweet. Uh, there are a lot of new things that have happened, uh, but we're gonna keep it relatively tidy. Yep. And after we go through and share some of these pieces, if uh, Karen Forner, if you have anything to add or, or correct, uh, Jason Jackson, anything that you wanna contribute there, Andy, uh, Tony, anybody who, who you feel like you have input on, on the news, go ahead and share that. And, yeah, and, and we've got our experts today, and we'll, we'll go mm -hmm. into uh, some introductions in a minute, but yep. we've got Karen with us, who we've had since the beginning. Yep. We've got Jason Jackson, who we have seen before, and we've got a new expert today, who is Audrey Rosenfeld, who mm -hmm. will be talking to us a bit more about uh, employee assistance. Mm -hmm. So, quickly, state of affairs. What's changed since last week? So round two of funding for the Paycheck Protection Program uh, looks like it's gonna be approved any time now. It has passed the Senate. It's expected to pass the House as soon as today. However, it's probably gonna be gone really quick because the banks have people all queued up and uh, I heard estimates from anywhere from a week, it lasting a week, to it lasting a day. Mm -hmm. So if you're already in queue, hold your breath and let's see what happens. If you're not in queue, by all means, try to apply, but know that, that this, is, this is kind of at its end. We were, we, I, we were talking to our banker from Bank of America oh. <laughs> and uh, asking some questions. And what, what did he what, say? So he's a very traditional banker type, very, always very buttoned down, always very banker presentation. And he said, you know what, to be honest with you guys, this whole thing is just a shit show. <laughs> The banker said that. The banker said that. So, so that's kind of what we're looking at. Uh, they're saying that they're anticipating that there will not be a round three of funding. So if that didn't work out for you, uh, it might be time to shift gears and figure out another way to proceed. Mm -hmm. Secondary, uh, so we're hearing lots about kind of the plan for back to work in Washington. Obviously, no one knows much for sure. 
um, but in terms of just kind of putting together what we're hearing, uh, we're hearing that the important factors for getting back to something that looks something like normal are getting our testing up, getting our ability to track uh, who people have contacted up, making sure we have enough PPE for everyone who needs it, making sure we have capacity in the healthcare care system. And the truth is the thing doesn't really end until we have a vaccine. That's when it's really over and done. Uh, what does the new normal look like? And of course, again, the answer is nobody knows. However, uh, they're saying most large gatherings are going to remain prohibited, which probably doesn't mean great things for those sports. So no, no Ducks games. However, uh, I think too, we need to be, be clear that it does not mean that it's going to look like quarantine forever. It does not mean that we're not going to be able to get two people together or even maybe 10 people together. Uh, but we got to kind of just Stay tuned and see what that looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, teleworking and distance learning will continue. Again, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to look like quarantine where we all have to stay home, but it does mean if we can work at home sometimes, then it's going to reduce that load of people on the same place, and that's going to be helpful. Uh, some industries will open faster than others. So this is somewhere where there's a little bit of news where uh, the state has released that there are three industries that they're trying to get up and running as quickly as they can, and those are uh, elective surgeries, outdoor recreation, and ding, 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 residential construction. And uh, I know that we have the question, well, why residential? Why not commercial? The hope would be that commercial would be right along behind that. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, the, the commentary about that is it could be even sooner than May 4th, could be around May 4th. We're still waiting on some, some information to come in to know exactly what that looks like, but that's what we have in front of us right now. Um, last piece, we've been hearing little bits and pieces of news about certain counties, certain cities who are just announcing that they are going to go ahead and open up despite the state not giving them the guidance to proceed yet. Uh, as always, you got you to gotta kind of follow your own, gotta make your own information yep. about these things. But uh, the governor has been pretty clear on the stance on this and has said that those locales that say that they are open, that that is not recognized by the state, that the state will still proceed and still close down projects mm -hmm. and still the, uh, some of the, those locales have been telling businesses to uh, not close down the site even if a state inspector tells them to. Mm -hmm. And the state has responded by saying, if we don't close down the site when the state tells us to, we can have some criminal or civil charges leveled against our company. Right, so that's basically a fight between the state and the city, but you could pay the price in between. So it's important that we get that information out there because it can be easy for people to say, no, I have this in hand, the local, local government says it's okay. Be aware that you there is still this conflict with the state and you can still get dinged by it. So briefly, uh, Jason Jackson, do you have anything to add or correct from, from that news? No, everything that you mentioned is what I have on, on that regard. Um, the only thing I'd like to add also is the complexity of what you, Carly, in the last point between state agencies and local agencies. Keep in mind, from an a, I'm an HR practitioner, so from an HR standpoint, right, we don't know. The people that's going to get caught in between this also are your employees. Not also, I mean, in so many different levels beyond the financial aspect because you're potentially exposing them. If, you, if a business opens up before the, the, the state opens up, what are you potentially exposing your employees to? Mm -hmm. Are they going to be personally charged or is the business going to be charged? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, so play out in the future. So yeah. uh, to think about as you make decisions for your business. Yeah. Uh, Karen Forner. So Karen Forner, you're with, uh, is it Employee Solutions? Is that right? Yep. Employer Solutions. Employer, Employer Solutions. Solutions, sorry. We only represent employers. Oh, it makes sense, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so anything to add, change, correct? Uh, well, just, you know, law school 101 is the higher the level of government, the authority they have over those underneath. So uh, I think the state governor has authority over city and county law. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I guess I wouldn't want to risk that someone, a sheriff in the media says, I may not enforce it. Uh, but that doesn't mean you're not going to get in trouble from the state or have other regulatory impacts if you violate stay home, stay healthy. Um, my personal opinion is we are all frustrated. 
it is very, very scary. And we are just done. And yet the end is who knows where in sight. And if I'm honest with myself and everyone else, there is no going back to normal, mm -hmm. likely for 18 to 24 months, if we're lucky. We're mm -hmm. hopeful for a new modified normal where the economic devastation and the social isolation mm -hmm. end because there's, there's really terrible um, psychic suffering mm -hmm. going on where human, we're social creatures by nature. Mm -hmm. I, I think we take for granted the interaction with the barista and the hello to our coworkers in the office, even if it's not extended. Mm -hmm. There's something about the lack of that that is causing suffering. Um, my personal terrible suffering is my parents. Mm -hmm. My parents are very, very close to my children and me. And it, 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 it's, it really is a level of suffering to have to distance myself from them. Yeah. Yeah. So I awesome. think people are getting and, frustrated. And, and so, are that, that, so Karen, that keys into the next point that I want to get to just to kick this whole thing off. So I wanted to talk to Wendy uh, because we're, we're talking with Audrey Rosenfeld of uh, Fully Effective Employees to provide some info about kind of the mental health aspect. Uh, but I wanted to go to Wendy first and, and ask about morale. And so there's a question that we received from, from Carrie Corris. And she's not here today with us, but she's been at, at previous sessions. She says, I can see my team morale is eroding. Do you have any suggestions to keep up morale at low or no cost? And I know, Wendy, that's something that's close to, to your heart and important to you in, in leadership. Do you have any, any thoughts there? Yeah, thank you, Jason. Um, you know, it's tough because things change so quickly. And like Karen was saying, everyone's sitting at home and they're isolated and we're used to having people around us. Um, on the ABC staff, you know, we've kind of become each other's support group. Mm -hmm. So we use Teams as an internal messaging system and that's fun. We can share pictures or jokes or whatever back and forth. So we have different chat groups there. And then um, I've just extended the amount of time that I spend with the staff. So we meet every Monday morning for staff. And then on Wednesday, we just do a check-in. And there's no big agenda. It's just, hey, how are you guys doing? What's going on? What do you need? You know, is there something that you haven't gotten and you need to wrap up the week? Um, and it's just very light. And again, no, no agenda. And, you know, I listen and I watch their their facial their body and their movements and stuff and you know just make sure i'm listening mm -hmm. another thing is we've gotten used to kind of thinking about the next thing that we're going to do mm -hmm. and right now we need to make sure that we're listening and paying yeah. attention and um you know and really cluing in to the team mm -hmm. So I know some people like more communication than others. So I went through and individually asked everybody, you know, do you want extra time with me? Do you need extra phone calls? And so that was nice because I miss seeing them all in the office, you know, and just having them stop by. Well, and and uh, Jason Lang had brought up a concept that was about leadership vulnerability and, and sharing the perspective that we're all going through this. So even if you're in a leadership position and you're, you're expected typically to be the, the point of strength, uh, it is valuable to to share some vulnerability there. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, construction and vulnerability don't go hand in hand, right? Yeah. Oil and water. Often weak and, you know, I mean, even, even me, you know, mm -hmm. I grew up the only girl with four brothers in Ketchikan as a contractor's daughter. And you, you were just tough. It didn't matter. You just, yeah. you just did it. And I had to learn how to be vulnerable over the last couple of weeks, just so then I can have a more open dialogue with members and with the ABC team. And it's tough when you're not used to it. Yeah. So uh, does anybody have any solution, any ideas for the way that you're looking after team morale? Any, any low cost, no cost options? Uh, Send us chocolate, I'll tell you that. That was Chocolate, good. Andy? Okay. Karen, what do you got? I'm out for the window, Andy. Yeah, I, I think the very, very optional uh, drop-in lunches, we, we're doing teams lunches. I'm setting Fridays 12 to 1, no obligation, but anyone who wants to take a break and eat their lunch and chit-chat, uh, completely optional happy hours, again, on Teams or Zoom, where people can just join in and chit-chat. Um, that way, if, if people are not interested, that's fine, but if people are seeking that connection, 
And then we're not talking about work because it's been so intense and anything to do with business is stressful. Uh, some people hold their cat and show their dogs to each other and just remembering we're humans and there's things other than the payroll protection program and stay home, stay healthy is I think helpful for morale. So if you have Absolutely. something you want to contribute, again, you can just start talking or if you, you want to put your hand up and check the yes box, I'd love to hear what everybody's doing. Jason, did you have something? Uh, Jackson? Uh, I echo the sentiments of the Zoom happy hours. I think not only with your current teams, but also uh, internally within your family members, right? That's remote, that's not, you're not able to visit because those are the type of things to just, the Zoom is just a tool to leverage in a different way that we haven't done in the past mm -hmm. uh, here. Um, I put on the chat box also as an option for, for business owners. I have a good friend that does, um, who heads up the HR department in, in, in Amada Health. But Amada Health basically provides telehealth uh, support, mental health. Um, they just offered free services for the next six months to anyone who had. Uh, so I don't know if your if your benefits program has it already. But first, I don't know if you have if you have a benefits program, check into your EAP programs, leverage those, promote those. This is the time to promote those to your employees. Yep. Yeah. Use it. If you don't have an EAP program. You might want to look into this program to see if it's something that you might uh, can leverage. I have not gone through it because my company offers EAP program. Mm -hmm. So again, this is just an alternative option for you to use because those uh, Zoom hours, lunch hours are great. But if you see an employee really, really struggling, this um, is definitely an option for you if you don't have an EAP program. EAP program already in place. That's great. Yeah, that's actually a great transition to our expert introductions mm -hmm. because we have Audrey Rosenfeld here today and that is her area of expertise. Mm -hmm. So Audrey, you want to tell us just a little about who you are? Thank you. Great segue, Jason. Thanks. Um, it was so Mary's I segue. Own it wasn't my segue. No, no. Yeah. Jason, back yeah. Um, I own a company called Fully Effective Employees, and we've been providing EAP services in the Puget Sound area since 1976. That was before my time, but um, we uh, really offer a service that we call as an employer and an employee assistance program. So I really agree with um, what Jason Jackson said. Um, and just to kind of a couple things that I think are sort of stand out for me is there's a lot of talk about um, hanging out with your family, um, going out in your backyard, things like that. But we have a number of employees who live alone and they might live in a room or an apartment. They don't have a backyard, they don't have a deck, they don't have anybody to see or to talk to all day and they've been holed up for a really long time. Those are the folks that I'm really concerned about. I also think that employees are really afraid to let on that they're struggling with their employers because we're dealing with a situation where there's massive layoffs and furloughs. And if somebody shows vulnerability or weakness, their fear is they're gonna be the ones to be cut. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes employers aren't even gonna know those are the individuals that are struggling. So we encourage employers, if they have an employee assistance program, to get with that program and find out how they can disseminate resources and information mm -hmm. and really normalizing a very abnormal situation. What we are all going through is unprecedented and it affects everybody. Mm -hmm. So generally in EAP, when people have problems, it might be fairly unique to them. But everybody I know and have talked with is affected by this in some way or another, and some okay. much worse than others. And so, Audrey, in, in layman's terms, yeah, an EAP is what in the simplest. I'm sorry, it's an okay. assistance program, and it's a confidential service that is provided to employees and their family members, and it's provided by the employer. Mm -hmm. So there are many different types of EAPs. There's inter there are internal EAPs through um, employers, larger employers. There are external programs like mine where we contract with different employers. We specialize in the construction and building trades and unions. Mm -hmm. And there are others that are offered for free as part of a, a health insurance package. So some companies have it. They don't even know they have it. They don't use it. Some companies don't. We provide service for up to companies with just three employees. So we think it's really an important piece because no matter what the size, you're going to be dealing with people who have issues. Well, and I think right now it's important that we think about the people who are laid off or the people who don't have access to EAP as well. I think it, having, having an emotional, what is it, no, employee assistance program mm -hmm. is super helpful, especially when things are running well. But, but 
that level of care becomes even more important right now. However, many of the people who are at most risk are probably not necessarily going to get access to that. I think the link that Jason provided, I definitely check that out. But do you have any other recommendations for folks, employers, or, or people who don't necessarily have an EAP or can't afford to buy one right now right, in terms right. of what they would do? Right. Well, I think that, you know, just in general, I think an EAP is a very good return on investment. It's really inexpensive. It's probably the most inexpensive benefit an employer will ever have. And it's really, really important right now. Um, I will be honest, the uh, social services are at their max right now. Um, they are so busy. Um, they're often not taking new clients. There's always the crisis clinic um, and the suicide hotline if people are feeling suicidal. Um, those are uh, free services that they can call 24-7. Um, and there are a number of um, uh, counselors that are offering a couple of pro bono sessions available. Mm -hmm. Almost all counseling sessions are done now by telemental health. Mm -hmm. So certainly that's something that we would encourage employers that if they don't have an EAP, um, there's, um, I can certainly come up with a couple of resources and send that to you that you might be able to send out to your members. Yeah. Um, I know early on, uh, Jay Inslee had promoted um, um, and a counseling service that was free. Uh, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. So if anybody, does anybody have access to that free counseling service? Jason Jackson, are you aware of that? I did hear about it, but I did not uh, take that to note, unfortunately. So, so if anybody can come up with the link, we can chase that down yeah, after we'll and share it with link. the group. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That would be great. Great. And then we can put it up on the ABC Tips yeah. page. So thank you for, for that information. That's super helpful. Well, can I add one thing? Just one more thing. The other issue is those that are in recovery and those that are um, either, you know, had a positive drug test and they're working a program or they voluntarily are in recovery. Um, those that are really depressed and isolated and dealing with all this may have a lot of addiction issues. And there are um, AA groups that are online. Mm -hmm. And they're still confidential. There's still a way of signing in with a, with a password and a code. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the treatment agencies are still providing resources online. So I think that's another resource employers should remind employees about. And again, if anybody can share the links for those, those are super helpful. Remember the value that we're trying to provide here is the curation of all that information mm -hmm. to try to pre-filter. Uh, because it's going to take you, Audrey, far less time than me or somebody else to find that exact nugget of, of wisdom. So really appreciate that help. Yeah. So the first question that we have uh, that we got was actually from Dale Sharp, mm -hmm. who we've been seeing in these sessions, but he's not able to be here this week. Yeah, but he's, he's, still... he's the safety lead for skis painting. Mm -hmm. And he still sent along a question, and this one is really relevant to what we're talking about right now. So he had asked about uh, kind of some of the bigger, deeper mental health challenges we're seeing. So Jason, would you go ahead and read his question? Sure. So he says, several times per week during COVID, uh, I'm on the phone interviewing teammates who've reported symptoms of illness via electronic form. Sometimes these interviews lead into conversations that enter into a much deeper realm than anticipated, triggered by a simple, how are you doing? What advice can be shared about how to respond uh, to outpouring of what to an untrained ear sounds like deep emotional problems. So, so when we say, how are you doing? And no one has asked them that question in a mm -hmm. long time. Sometimes we get answers that are really deep. So when someone says, I'm lonely, well, we can all kind of relate to that. Yeah. But sometimes we hear those problems and we say, I don't necessarily want to try to address this because I don't want to cause more harm than I'm doing good. Mm -hmm. So both from our experts, but also from our mm -hmm. business leaders, what are some thoughts about this? Because I'm sure it's happening everywhere. And so if you could just click on the yes, no button or the hand button, let's go to Jason Lang. What do you got? So our team has dealt with this. We've actually got a couple of employees who tested positive for COVID. Um, one was a guy and his wife, and it came about as a bit of a surprise. They had kids at home. They didn't have any masks and stuff. So our team stepped up. I reached out to a friend of mine and asked, um, she has somebody staying with her that was sewing masks. And so I got those, they dropped them off. And then the very next day they were like, hey, could we, could we buy them groceries? Um, and so they went the next day, dropped them groceries and stuff. We got a specific list from them. And then for one of our other employees, we did the same thing. We basically, as a management group, all kind of basically agreed like, hey, we're gonna help this person so-and-so is going to go to the store. So-and-so is going to get the stuff. They're going to drop it off at their house. And so we were 
able to do that. But I mean, well, a so lot that's, of that's not necessarily answering the question head on, but you are providing support uh, just to let them yeah. know that you're there. But I think the, the yeah. question of when we start hearing things that from our employees and again, uh, often you hear where they're like, I'm just really freaked out and I'm really anxious. And that's, we all feel that way. And you can absolutely respond to that by saying, yeah, me too. Yeah. But what happens when the things that you're hearing, like if someone says something like, I don't know, I'm just starting to think about doing something crazy or, mm -hmm. you know, the, the kind of things that people say that start speaking to problems that you're almost afraid to engage with. Because I think when the concerns we're hearing, the mental health concerns we're hearing are, are sort of that surface level, mm -hmm. then absolutely the advice is engage with them. Mm -hmm. Be a person, because we all could use that. But I think there's a good question to ask of what happens when you start to be nervous that, that what you say might not be the right thing. So Jason, you put your, Jason Jackson, you put your hand up. What did you, what did you have? Sure, so as an HR person, I think everybody stops on my couch to talk about <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Um, that's just putting some levity into this serious situation, but you are absolutely correct. But uh, I think you laid on the foundation. If you feel that the conversation is something more along the lines, like getting resources, having a lending of an ear kind of situation, do that, mm -hmm. right? What sometimes most uh, people managers do, kind of uh, get in, roped into is if you are the personality that is more of a, a have a hero complex that try to solve everything, that's where the dangerous line comes into play because of the fact that we aren't even for myself. I'm, a, I mean, I have a psych background, but I am not a mental, ther a mental health ther therapist. Um, so the moment that you feel a couple of things that the person's eminent danger, definitely I would side the, the way of caution. I don't know if Audrey uh, agrees yeah. with this. Definitely call 911 mm -hmm. uh, if you feel that the person's coming in danger. Now, feel free to say also, if that's not the case, feel free to say if you've gotten to the point where it's beyond your means to result to provide resources or help, mm -hmm. uh, definitely make the statement say, I, I, I see that you're having a problem, difficult time with this. Let me see if I can find someone for you. Mm -hmm. to get additional assistance. And this is where Audrey's line of work comes into play. If you have it as a people, that's why I, I bring it up in this particular forum. Mm -hmm. It's very appropriate to have an EAP program, not to go back on Audrey again, but this is one of the tools that yeah. uh, the people leaders should have in their back pocket, right? Yeah. Because you never know when these come up. If, even though if you take out the pandemic situation mm -hmm. in the regular normal times, these type of things come up. We don't, we, we are, that's why I always say, and I agree with what uh, Audrey mentioned, this is one of those low cost benefit tools that will, that will benefit you in spades so many, so many times because of the fact that you never know when it's gonna come up. So, uh, okay. so you say uh, low cost and we've been kind of dancing around this and Karen Forner had the question, uh, can Audrey tell us, give us a, just an idea, a ballpark idea of what are we talking about in terms of cost of an EAP? And I know that's gonna be specific. Yeah. Again, generally EAPs are. Did we lose her? Did we lose Audrey? Am I on? Yep. There we go. <laughs> uh oh. We may be having some connectivity. Oh no, we so Audrey, you're muted. There. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Let's so try again. I think that. Generally, uh, EAPs um, are around two dollars an employee per uh -oh. month. It depends on the size of the company. I know for us, sometimes if it's a small employer, we're going to charge a flat rate of five hundred dollars or something. But it's very inexpensive. So you said two dollars per employee per month. Is that right? Uh oh. Yeah, we're maybe having just yeah. Just I don't know. Add it to the. Go ahead, Jason. Jason, go ahead. That sounds about right. I don't know what exact numbers for her, but from my experience in, in, in negotiating benefits for other clients, it's usually ranges from two, three dollars because EAP can range in services anywhere from mental health all the way to legal health mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and caring uh, and elderly care resources, all those things just depends on what 
what options you brought bring into the program. Yeah, great. Sorry, right. are you able to hear me now? Yes. Yes. I'm so sorry. I don't know if I had an internet glitch or what. I apologize. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Did you hear my rate or my? Said piece? it was about two dollars yeah. per employee yeah. per month. And I just wanted to add, if I could, to um, uh, follow up with what Jason was talking about when um, a, an owner or a manager is hearing from an employee that's stressed. I think the first thing is to just really normalize what they're feeling and to make it okay for them to talk about it. Yeah. And then to ask them what they need. So sometimes I think we often jump in and offer solutions before we even know what they need. Mm -hmm. So it's sometimes appropriate to say, how can I help? Well, and, and I um, think what kind of resources are you looking for? Yeah. Um, and obviously, if they have an EAP, that's the time to say, why don't you think about contacting the EAP? Yeah. And this is a topic that's much greater in terms of suicidal ideation. Yeah. But it's okay to ask somebody if they're thinking about harming themselves or if they've ever thought about suicide. Yeah. I think most people are afraid to ask because they don't want to hear the answer in case it's yes. Yeah. But yeah. it's oftentimes it's asking is not going to make someone kill themselves. Mm -hmm. And if they're thinking about it, they've already thought about it, whether we ask them or not. Yeah. And and sometimes just asking and putting it out there and letting them know that you can listen or you can find them somebody to listen is obviously op op option, a best prevention. It really can be the most helpful thing is just to ask and listen and then say, this is really not something I'm able to help you with, but let me find you somebody who can. Yeah. Well, and I think going back to the topic that Wendy introduced with had to do with the vulnerability of leader leadership. Even in the leadership position, everybody's stressed. It creates that opportunity for, for getting on the same level as somebody else when we wouldn't normally take that approach. In this situation, it's a little bit different. I'm gonna to go to uh, Bill Greenwood. He uh, joins us all the way from Massachusetts, uh, which is pretty exciting. And so, Bill, I think you had a question that was related to an HR topic. What do you got, Bill? Uh, yes, I was just curious. Um, if you guys are talking about pre- you know, pre-startup from construction. And what I'm looking at is the possibility what but actual work starts to starts to happen. Mm -hmm. All right. And you reach out to your employees, you say, okay, do you want to come back to work? And then they're on unemployment or they're on the, you know, obviously they're gonna be paid like a small business loan to they're paying them. Um, how do you handle that situation if they're not comfortable with actually coming back to work? I mean, that obviously will play a lot in your business when you want to go and do stuff to your customers. Yeah, and so I, I correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, let me, let me rephrase just to make sure we get it. So you're saying uh, we have employees who are on the bench right now, and you're saying, okay, guys, I need you to come back to work, and they're saying no? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, and we actually have that question from somebody else, too. We do, yeah. yeah. So obviously this is a, this is a, of a lot of, importance yeah so are there are there any legal requirements that we should be thinking about are there any hr situations that we should be contemplating with that mm -hmm. so essentially if they're concerned for their own health or they're concerned mm -hmm. for the health of other people at home uh, and they're not wanting to risk uh, going out back into the workforce so if we have an essential project mm -hmm. and we we call on those people and they say no i'm not coming in how do we how do we deal with that? Mm -hmm. So who has thoughts on that? So Karen, do you have any input there? Well, other than we're getting hundred calls a week on these issues, it's really, really, really complicated. Um, I've just never known anything so complicated. On the one hand, who doesn't need to come to work or should be accommodated under the Americans with Disabilities Act or some of the COVID-19 protections that the governor has put in place. Um, you know, that just last week they were protecting vulnerable people. They're allowed to use leave if they can telecommute or their jobs should be held open until some later date. Uh, but then there's also the issue of what if someone's in a vulnerable population and they don't want to be accommodated. Yeah. I'm, I'm 72 and I want to get back out there. What are your obligations to have a safe and healthy workforce? You're responsible for the safety of every worker. Mm -hmm. Can someone who you know ha is on dialysis mm -hmm. safely go out in the workforce? So there's, it, it's super delicate, fine line. EEOC and human rights commissions have had guidelines. 
In some cases we've advised or we've asked the employee's doctor yeah. to look at the job description. This is what the exposure is. These are our safety protocol. Mm -hmm. Can this person safely return to work? They, were, they wanted him to work remotely. So there's, it wasn't a show up or you don't have a job, yeah. but I think it was um, just that worker's preference. It's a really, really fine line and I, I think uh, we're seeing a lot COVID more. COVID-19. I think we're seeing a lot more flexibility uh, in in yeah. the application of the law, just because it is a weird time. Uh, well, that's the problem. If you get too flexible, no mm -hmm. good deed goes unpunished, right? right? And you've got yeah. three years to file your discrimination claim. So, yeah. you know, so, I've had a lot of employers who do the right thing, and they still get sued for four hundred thousand dollars and back. Uh, so, you know, paid rest breaks because they didn't document it right. So, so I just think uh, as we're bringing people back into the workforce, yep. employment law still applies. It's dicey. That's so all Karen, I'm saying. Yeah, thank you. So Jason, uh, Jackson, did you have input on this topic? So I'm going to parse out my response because Karen is also right because HR versus legal response to this is totally different, right? Um, for Bill's situation, I've actually had that come up with a lot of my clients. First and foremost, you got to figure out if if your state um, has a stay at home, you know, like we do here in Washington, and, and non essential businesses are are not supposed to be operating. You must be a hundred percent clear that whether your business is essential or not. Because let's face it, we all know that there are some out there who are not abiding by the rule. Well, so, and, and for your information, Jason, I think Bill, you do uh, saw cutting, concrete saw cutting. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. We're a yeah. concrete saw company. We were essential and we did get a letter and we also have letters sent out to us by our customers stating that their job is essential. Yep. Got it. We have a and, and so from the HR standpoint, now you have an employee who doesn't necessarily want to come back to work. Uh, and, and what do you do there? So first and foremost, you have to make sure that you're following the CDC guidelines. Mm -hmm. Social distancing, how do you do that in your workplace? You have to have policies in place. Um, and at the same time, are you screening your employees on a daily basis? What does that look like? Um, I have a plant that, uh, a food manufacturing client that every day as people come in, we ask them three questions. Mm -hmm. Have a fever? Have you had a cough? You know, have you been exposed to someone? If any of those are positive, unfortunately, we send you home. Mm -hmm. um, to your point, and once you uh, abide by the CDC guidelines, you make you know PPE requirements, hand washing uh, opportunities, uh, uh, places that you can wash your hands. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if, this, if all of those doesn't work and the person does not want to come into work, mm -hmm. ultimately, this is the trick, the sticky part. You can take it on as a issue, but the question is, should you? Mm -hmm. Right? And that's the fund of, that's the ten thousand dollar question. Is should yeah. you take it on the, that, that path? My yeah. recommendation is you shouldn't. You should just go to the next person who's willing to come into work. Right. So I, I wanna thank you for that. So I wanna open it up in the case that other folks here have questions. We wanna make sure that we get to that. I see Justin Corgett here. Uh, Scott Garcia, do we have any other, other contractor related questions that we want to make sure that we, we get included? I know Jason Lang, you always have questions, but I want to make sure that we, we hold on that uh, to make sure other folks didn't have something they needed help with. So do we have any, any you could use the yes or you could just start chittering if you have a, a question. No? Okay. Uh, Travis, did you have a question for us? Well, I did coming into this, but uh, it was answered, or at least answered in part, by That's good awesome. questions. Yeah. As far as uh, just connecting with our team mm -hmm. in unique and different ways, and ways that uh, boost morale. So we kind of got onto that. Uh, I love uh, Karen's suggestion as far as the Zoom lunch and uh, happy hour. Um, so I was just kind of looking for creative ways to connect with our team. I do the, all the traditional things mm -hmm. that you can probably think of. A lot of it's very similar to what Wendy discussed earlier, but what are some unique and creative ways of connecting with the team and boosting morale all at the same time? Yeah. Well, and another uh, very construction specific boost to morale that you can think about is that right now where we're at, when you kind of listen to the wind, is everyone is ready to think about when it's time to go back to work. 
everybody wants to go back to work. And of course, we can't go back to work. But what we can do is look at those projects that we have upcoming and figure out, can we, can we get together on Zoom and start planning for these projects? Can we start looking at the, the details? And what that does is, A, it gets us really prepared so that when it's time to go back, we really know we have our feet under us. But B, it lets everybody kind of start thinking about when we can go back to work, no matter how long that is, no matter how far away it is, it lets all of those people kind of get this sense of normalcy of let's look at drawings, let's look at plans, let's you're, talk about how focusing, we're going to do this. You're focusing on something else. We're actually spending a lot of time doing that. Uh, we call it project coaching, where we're helping companies walk through learning how to run projects. And it's not that you didn't know how before, but we go through together as a team and it works like team building, but we're also uh, developing practices and skill sets. But spending time doing that can be really good for your team. And in, you know, for ABC staff, mm -hmm. that could be thinking about events that you have coming mm -hmm. up, you know, if it's not construction, but whatever that is, taking something that exists in that undefined future and planning for it can help everybody feel like, oh, right, because the normal world does still exist. Again, not the normal pre-COVID world, but that that there is a sense of normalcy and that things, good things are coming. Mm -hmm. So there was a, another question that we had. This was from Kerry Cordes. Essentially, they were working on projects and their neighbor called L&I on them, mm -hmm. uh, saying that they were, were doing work and didn't believe that their work was essential. Uh, so then, then they were able to split, explain to L&I, had the conversation with them that, that projects of theirs were essential uh, and then had the conversation with the neighbor uh, about it. And so it, it just brought up this, this interesting uh, situation. Uh, does anybody have any thoughts or whether it's legal or, or relationship based in terms of how to navigate that, that pitfall? A lot of people are available to report now. Well, and I think the important piece of this question is, you know, obviously, if you're getting reported and you talk to L and I, and L and I says yes, you're fine, then the the element of that that is, you know, being in trouble for working is kind of off the table. Mm -hmm. However, if you have a neighbor who keeps reporting you, they may feel really upset about this. They may feel like you're endangering people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have feelings about this and it can damage that relationship because one day we're gonna go back to being everyday neighbors again. You don't forget that stuff. Mm -hmm. What do you have, Jason Jackson? So I, here's the thing. In my neighborhood, we're a brand new community. And one of the things in this type of situation is everybody's in the heightened alert. I think one good way, if you or if you are a a service provider, maybe a suggestion to your to your customers or your clients, basically, hey, alert your neighbors that we're coming. Mm -hmm. you know, we're doing this. We made sure that you know um, that this is an essential need because our gas pipe is leaking. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> but we need to get that corrected. So that type of thing and and prevention is always a good way to go. And if you have <laughs> habits in your neighborhood, definitely go to that person. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know, this is private. Private is like from the bewitched back in the 50s. <laughs> yes. So, so there, there's- And I think that's a, that's a great suggestion because mm -hmm. the uh, question was actually in relation to a, I believe a person who lives near their shop. Mm -hmm. So as people are coming in and out of the business, then the person who lives next door is getting upset. And you could see we're having some kind of a signage outside of your shop that says, uh, hey, Washington, we're an essential business. We're here to help. Mm -hmm. Here are some descriptions of some of the projects we're working on uh, just to kind of communicate that mm -hmm. in a way, you know, again, maybe they won't come outside and see the sign, but if they see the sign, that could help smooth the path where they understand what you're doing. So here's another great question from Jason Lang. It sounds like he uh, is, is out for the moment, but I'll ask it on his behalf. So what legal responsibilities or liability does an employer have if some of your employees test positive. So what are the steps that you need to make sure that you take? What should you be thinking about? Uh, what, what are the considerations there in terms of notification, in terms of testing or returning to work? What do you do if you're an employer who has, has folks who test positive? We have input there. Audrey, did you have thoughts on that or is, is that? Uh... 
That's probably a little bit more of an HR legal question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Karen, do you have input there? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, so I'm an employer and one of my employees tests positive for COVID. What are the steps legally <laughs> or otherwise that I should take, that I'm required to take, uh, whether it's best practice or requirement in the situation? Yeah. Uh, the CDC uh, is probably your best bet right now. I would go to the Washington State COVID page. Look what Washington Department of Health mm -hmm. uh, has outlined. If you're within King County, they have slightly different guidelines. And CDC has come out with a new, what do you do if an employee is positive guidelines. So uh, again, these, these safety protocol have changed every single week over the last five or six weeks. Um, as we learn more about the virus and how it's transmitted. And it, I think it's more airborne contagious than we yep. initially thought. So, uh, so check with your safety officer. If you're a member of ABC, uh, Tony uh, is a great resource. Um, if you feel it's more complicated than that, you can give my firm or someone else in this area a call. I'm just, so the protocol Jason, change, make sure what you're looking at is not dated March 25th, because if it yeah. is, it's outdated. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Jason, that's a good Jay, advice. Jason Jackson, did you have two cents to put in on this? Uh, yeah, so this is a three-pronged approach, right? First, you gotta take care of the employee, then you gotta take care of your other employees, and then you gotta take, take care of your, your surroundings, your environment. So the employee, first of all, if the employee comes up to you and says, hey, I've been exposed or I have contracted the disease, um, definitely take care of him or her understand what they need, how you can help. And the type, of course, from a time off perspective, give them all the time that they need. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have benefits, great. If not, then definitely find out what you can do in that regard. Then as far as taking care of the rest of your employees, you, from an HR perspective, definitely notify there's some potential exposure. Mm -hmm. But of course, your communication should always, always protect the, per the first person. Mm -hmm. you have no legal obligation. You have the legal obligation to protect health information, well, that includes the identity of that person. Um, so definitely that's the, uh, be, in your communication, feel free to say, I cannot divulge the person that we're talking about just to protect that person, but I'm letting you know there's a potential exposure in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And then the third one, definitely make sure you sanitize your workplace as soon as possible. And that will, should contain the situation as much as possible. Mm -hmm. There are things that I'm skipping over, for example, you know, if, if that person came into the office at what point, you know, what is the, and, and, and what your office looks like, things of that nature and the, and the gestation period within where that person came into contact with, and also potentiality of that person coming into contact with other people. Mm -hmm. Find that out as much as possible. All those things come into play. So I know that the office sterilization piece is something that's relevant and important. And I know, Wendy, you had a cleaning company come in and, and clean the office. Uh, I don't know that that had anything to do with a specific concern, but it was just kind of a general best practice, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you share anything about that sterilization process, cost-wise or otherwise? Uh, yeah, the cost was based on the square footage of our building. So it's about 6,000 square feet. So it was $1,500 for her to come in. They spent about eight or nine hours disinfecting and sanitizing the office. She had a team of three. And um, they cleaned the, I mean, they cleaned everything. It was completely sanitized and disinfected when we went back in. Right, and, and so I'm sorry, what was the cost? It was 1500 bucks. Okay, got it. So it could be worthwhile to think about, even just as a good best practice when we all remobilize and go back to the office to kind of start, start fresh, that could, could provide value. Okay, so other questions that, that have come up. Again, we have more to go off of here. Sarah, did you have anything specific that you're, you're struggling with right now? Erickson? No, everything's good, <laughs> good to go, awesome. Okay, uh, another one that I have here has to do with returning to work. So when we go back to work, uh, do we believe that there are going to be any testing requirements that, that employees need to be tested? Or if you have, have contracted COVID, is there a requirement that you have some sort of clean bill of health? I know that there was a discussion about this, uh, and I believe that the state had said no, but does anybody have any information related to that topic in the near future? Jason? 
Jason? I, um, I have not heard anything definitive. Um, again, the only one area where we do screen right now on a, on a daily basis is my client who does food manufacturing because it makes sense, right? Um, it just depends on your business and what the best practice is, but uh, a, a government mandate, I have not heard anything to, to, as of yet. I think it's just more of a best practice to do it, but I would probably think there would be something along that lines, but to what degree? Because it's all, it still is protected health information. So, yeah. uh, and, and, and there's a fine line that government agencies need, are gonna be going to, to walk on and understand and, 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 in the, in, and balance the, the, the safety of the, the, of the population, so. Got it. Yep. Uh, so I wanna go to Andy briefly. Andy, the GA guy. I love that. Sounds like you have some, uh, some brief update for us on the state of the world. Yeah, just a couple things. Um, was just uh, I had to hide for a minute because I was on the f a call with uh, one of the um, state legislators, and there's a couple things to pass along. One is just uh, as you, I'm sure everybody on this call has probably already seen, there was an Everett Herald article last week that outlined the recommendations that the industry made to the governor. We're waiting for specifics, but what you can certainly expect with regard to return to work, it, it, the question comes up about what's going to need to be done. There's very likely going to, you know, they're going to want to make sure that there's a real close watch on making sure that people who are on site are healthy and any signs or symptoms are going to mean to take corrective action and so on. And if you need help with that, uh, Tony put together an amazing uh, procedural guideline that's available, as we've talked about before. So I just want to plug that one more time. Um, another element that came up both in a national task force call I had this morning with um, other chapters uh, and ABC National. And so I conveyed it to the legislator is one of the concerns that we have is making sure that there is coordination between the, 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 the safety protocols and, and criteria that are coming, not just from the state, but then perhaps from your county, perhaps from a city, as you get down to lower and lower jurisdictional levels, sometimes there's nuance there. And I've told them, you know, as much as possible, if they can make sure that there's a, an effort within the layers of government to coordinate those so that we don't have somebody with a job site in Puyallup that has one set of protocol. And then when they go to federal way, there's three or four of the things that could trick somebody up if they happen to be working at different job sites over the course of a day or over a week and so on. And she, she thought that was a really good point and she's gonna pass that on to make sure, but I know that Ellen and I is working to make sure that what they're doing is about educating and helping to reinforce um, so just know that. And so don't be afraid if you see the folks from Ellen and I coming mm -hmm. to help us to make sure that we, we are towing the line. Very hopeful that, you know, in the next week or so, we'll start to get a little more clarity from the governor on what maybe a phase one rollout is going to look like for residential. And that's still not clear on when they say residential, whether it's going to involve if there's mixed use pro projects that have a residential component. If that's and and multi multifamily, multifamily residential kind of is that blurry line between yep. residential and commercial for sure. And it's a really great point that you brought up just in terms of the coordination. So earlier on in the session, we talked about conflict between the state direction and a city direction and, and who, uh, whose direction takes priority. And obviously the state has more power than the cities in this case. But the, the point that you bring up in terms of uh, making sure that that effort of, of making the requirements coordinated between the cities is really important because for folks like Travis who are working in how many different cities in a given day uh, with all essential projects, it's important that, that the people doing the work actually understand the requirements that they're working inside of. Mm -hmm. And we need to make it as easy as humanly possible to understand because the easier it is to understand, the greater the chance that we're actually kind of follow through with it. Okay. So as you think about you know, where you're going to be able to roll out and redeploy because it's coming, it's coming soon. Mm -hmm. Asking all business owners, anyone in, in, who has responsibility for, for these sorts of things, if you're seeing those in, inconsistencies, even if it's coming from an inspector who comes and says something, it, it's more often likely going to be either a narrow interpretation or a misinterpretation or maybe an excessive interpretation of how things are supposed to be by an inspector versus what's intended. Mm -hmm. Please get those to me because yeah. I can pass those along. I've got legislators who will help us to get that done and, and to try to streamline and, and, and remedy those things. So just You're saying if, if there's a, a problem that somebody's running into, email yeah. you the problem if it's related to legislation yeah. 
that's related to the rules that we're working under. Yeah, it's not likely to be legislation at this point as much as the yeah. proclamation and the lack yes. of clarity because every, every, every layer of clarification we've had still has the opportunity to drive a Mack truck through it. And this is yep. another mixed-use multifamily, and we don't know whether that's included in phase one. We'll know next yep. week. Hopefully. Well, and there's a lot of different information going around, but I would say another thing that I would call out as really important is there's been a lot of, we talked about this at the beginning, a lot of kind of mixed direction mm -hmm. where people are saying, uh, you don't have to listen to these inspectors, or if these inspectors tell you to stop, don't stop. If you're in that situation, I would absolutely recommend if an, if an inspector is telling you to, to pause, pause. Go yeah. figure this stuff out, get whatever direction you need, get whatever clarification you need, but I would not be running under the assumption that it's okay to mm -hmm. ignore any, any authority having jurisdiction. So we're, yeah. we're about to the bookend of our hour. Do we have any last minute questions or comments by a show of yes, no? Put your hands up, anything along those lines? Anybody? Good to go, rock and roll. All right, well, thank you so much, Audrey, for being with us, we really thank appreciate you. that. Okay, Travis, you wanna get us out of here? Well, and thank you to Jason and yeah, Karen Jason as well. Jackson, we appreciate Karen. your expertise every yeah. week. We appreciate always appreciate you. Yeah. And come back every week, please Keep do. coming back, we really appreciate having you here. Yeah. Travis, let's do it. Okay, well, I hope everybody uh, walks away today with at least one or two items that uh, they can implement right away. I know I've got two, so that's perfect. Anyways, uh, the way we exit these things is kind of the same way a, a football team breaks the huddle. We all put our hands up and we do the ready and bring them together and break, right? So if we <laughs> not, all bring not, our hands. Wait, 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 not you, <laughs> Bill. Don't do this, Bill. <laughs> Keep your hands on the wheel. <laughs> I'm driving. That's scary. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Ready? Hands are all up. Ready? Break. Right. All right. Good seeing everybody. It's good to see everybody. Thank you. Keep in touch. Thank you. If there's stuff you want to talk about, stay healthy. We'll see you next Thank week. You.